Hello and welcome everyone, this is Kalabovich coming to you with another episode of Deck Check. Today we will be diving in the expedition format and we will be sitting on the throne in expedition. Well, not a throne per se, just a whole sanctum, Varus sanctum that is, the good old crowd favorite of the sanctums. Yeah, let's just dive in. For the longest of times I wanted to create a true control deck in the expedition format. Now, there have been some problems, uh, I mean, maybe not problems, there have been some control decks in the metagame so far, but they either relied on curses, which are, in my opinion, hated on in the current environment with a lot of main deck attachment hate, with permafrost being just taken out by any and all means, be it linebreaker shield, be it infinite hourglass, or other uh, other ways, but uh, a true control, may maybe not a unitless per se, is something that I've strived for for the longest of times. I mean, you do have your Shadow X, but these are all more value decks, more, more mid-range decks, in my opinion, than true control decks. Uh, also, you have your Carentan control, but that one is slightly lacking card draw. Uh, so... I wanted to start by focusing on uh, what I would call a fan favorite card that is called Varus Sanctum. This is a six cost double shadow relic that says while you have exactly one unit, it has plus three attack, deadly and lifesteal. Now you probably have seen this deck running somewhere in throne around the tier three uh, deck uh, value category, but in throne you had uh, very, some very good uh, tools uh, for that deck, like uh, Harbinger. In Eternal card game, it is very important what exactly is the source of damage. For example, if a unit is dealing damage, and if it has deadly, then the whole deadly uh, triggers and uh, the uh, recipient of the damage dies. Uh, for example, if you are dealing damage via spells, then it counts whether you have any uh, additional uh, skills thanks to some relic weapons, for example, whether you have Overwhelm with Stone's Carmel or something like that, or if you have bonus spell damage from some units or other sources. Now, in the case of Black Sky Harbinger with Vara Sanctum, it worked uh, in the way that you have Vara Sanctum in play, you have no units in play, you're playing Black Sky Harbinger, you're dealing one damage to each unit on uh, the opposing side of the board and given that Bla Black Sky Harbinger has deadly uh, you're just decimating their whole board. Now Black Sky Harbinger unfortunately is not present in Expedition but there are other ways of dealing damage with your units. Not as numerous but they are still here. Two of them are included in this deck in main deck and one in the market but the market one is more of a meme one and I mean, sure, the thing, the fact that I wanted to create a control deck in Expedition doesn't mean this is necessarily tier one, unfortunately, but at least at least I tried and this deck has uh, provided me and, uh, and my viewers with a lot of cool games for sure. I mean, you probably have seen some of my epic highlights with, with this specific deck. So... Uh, in the case of Varus Sanctum, I mean, I know it is a very uh, expensive relic, so you have to live till the turn you are playing Varus Sanctum and the turn after that you're playing a unit probably, or you already have a unit in play. Uh, but uh, the unit that synergizes the most with Varus Sanctum in the Expedition format, in my opinion, is Tamaris Earthshaker, the 6 cost um, double primal for 6 explorer mage. Uh, because she has shift 3, deal 1 damage to each enemy without flying. And remember, this does include sights, and you can ping some sights off, for example, with Tamaris and with Varus Favor or stuff like that. It has happened uh, in uh, some of my games for sure. Now, uh, if you have Varus Sanctum in play, if you shift Tamaris, she deals 1 damage to each enemy without flying, which is a slightly worse version of uh, Black Sky Harbinger. Uh, also, remember she is shifted for three turns, so before she emerges as a 7-6 flying, deadly, lifesteal, unblockable, huge unit, uh, 
you you have to you have to make do with with some other units in between you can play some other units you can jump with them etc etc the other unit that synergizes quite well with var sanctum is blitrock linrise listener now this is uh, this is one of the listeners that has been picked up quite a bit in the recent months uh, from what i've seen it is a four cost triple primal mystic in uh, this is the primal listener that has the ability of pay three to deal one damage to an enemy she if she has deadly then it just means you're just pinging each opposing unit away 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 and obviously she invokes primal on summon and on mastery and remember mastery triggers off of you paying three and pinging with uh, with her ability uh, so yeah these are the eight units that synergize with vara sanctum the most but remember vara sanctum is a card is a permanent card that gives your unit plus three attack deadly and lifesteal which means even if you don't have one of those units to decimate your opponent's board for example if you just have an incarnus in play incarnus is still a six two unblockable lifestealer that uh, procs uh, her mastery faster uh, than, uh, than without sanctum and also can help you to race with the opposing units uh, rounding out the unit department, we have four copies of Blight Pest Smuggler, and I'm going to get to the market at the end of this video. Uh, but uh, there is one biggest problem with Varus Sanctum, and that is a card that I'm also running here called Permafrost. Uh, if one of your units gets permafrozen, then uh, the whole deal with Sanctum is usually off. You, the unit is stunned. And if you play another unit, it doesn't benefit from the throne. So you have to do some build arounds. For example, you can uh, you can kill your own unit that is permafrozen, or maybe you can uh, uh, you can play Reality Breaker and kill it in the meantime, or do something like that. Uh, but I do believe I uh, there should be also a card in the market that takes care of that unit, even if it's just a devour. Uh, but that is just a small hindrance uh, because uh, not uh, not all decks are running permafrost, fortunately. And uh, you still get to, uh, for example, if you're playing unitless for the longest of times, if you uh, play Varus Sanctum and then you shift Tamara's Earthshaker into play, she is going to get at least one hit in before she gets permafrozen. So there is that. If Blitrock gets permafrozen, she still can ping away your uh, the opposing units. So there is that. And also, uh, yeah, cards you are invoking from Blitrock and Incarnus can also get rid of your own unit that is permafrozen. So there is that. Uh, as this is a control deck, we are running a ton of spells. Uh, 25 power to start things off. We are not running any Tazboos. We are not running any Rosts. So we can split Primal and Shadow half and half with one in favor of Shadow because we are running Devouring Shadow, which I'm going to get to in a moment. Uh, but aside from that 25 power, we are also running four Seek power. Uh, draw a sigil of your choice from your deck and four copies of Varus Favor. Deal one damage, life seal, draw a shadow sigil from your deck. Which means that technically you are running five more shadow sources than primal sources. And this also means that technically you're running 33 power. But uh, if you had been playing control in this game or in other card games, you know that in control decks you want to have much more power than in otherwise mid range or aggressive decks. Uh, the rest is uh, just uh, unit removal and card draw. Uh, four copies of Eremos Designs. I believe this card could be quite good in the current meta game, especially that all the emblems are two drops. This kills a lot of early stuffs for stuff for elves, for Cumbrai aggro, uh, some things for uh, for uh, Elysian as well, or just uh, procs there uh, daring Griffin away. Uh, so there is that. Uh, two copies of Lightning Strike. This is a split, two permafrost, two lightning strikes. I do think I could be running just one permafrost in the market instead of, I don't know, Reality Breaker in the end. Uh, because uh, a lot of decks have good answers to permafrost, like Elysian has infinite hourglass usually in the market, so they don't care about those permafrost, and this is just a card that is lost. But for example, Stone Scar usually 
does not have a lot of answer to that unless they are running Boar in the market or unless they are a dragon version that is running uh, draconic ire in the market as well. Uh, but some, sometimes you just need those permafrost. So that is why the split of two and two between that and lightning strike, uh, the fast spell that deals four damage to an attacking enemy. And remember, lightning strike also works on relic weapons. And that is a huge upside for this one. Uh, two copies of reread to get back your favorite spell, whether it's uh, Lightning Strike or an Edict of Makar for a cheap removal from the market, or the Devouring Shadow, or Wisdom of the Elders if you're lacking cards, or even just a Seek Power. Uh, four copies of Devouring Shadow, uh, a spell that permanently gives a unit minus one minus one for each of your Shadow Influence. Four copies of Wisdom of the Elders, a three cost double primal fast spell that draws you two cards. Yes, unfortunately, in the current uh, uh, expedition format, there is rather, card draw is rather lacking, but aside from those Wisdom of the Elders, remember you are creating, you are invoking some cards with four listeners here and four listeners, listeners there. So in theory, you have uh, 12 sources of card draw. And that is more than in other decks usually, unless you're counting Sodi Spell Shapers, because that's uh, that's the, uh, I believe, most played source of card advantage these days. Uh, rounding out the uh, kill spell suite, we have four copies of In Cold Blood, a double shadow spell that kills an enemy unit. But wait, there's more. If it was uh, Justice or multi-faction that included Justice, the enemy player discards each copy from their hand and deck. They can't leave the void, and you lose all justice influence. With the last part doesn't matter because you're not running any justice influence. So there is that. And then Cold Blood is a great answer to uh, Archgriffin Patriarchs, uh, to uh, Forbidden Rider Outcasts, to uh, a lot of Combrai stuff, etc., etc. So yeah, uh, those in Cold Bloods uh, are necessary here. I am running them here instead of Fell Rituals because I am not running any Void Recursion whatsoever because and also in this deck i'm running tamaris i'm not running carvets because carvet is a non-bow which is an anti-combo vara sanctum because carvet brings a friend and he already has life seal and he already has a, a lot of health so vara sanctum doesn't help carvet at all unless you somehow sacrifice that cultist but that's that's not what this deck is about that is uh, that is why carvet is not being run here in this control deck all right let's get to the market we have one copy of edict of makar a cheap removal spell for time and justice units we have tome of horrors and i'm gonna stop here for one moment now this is my usual follow-up this is my usual go-to card when I play my first uh, smuggler, unless I want to, I, and I need to go for Edict of Makar or Malediction. Uh, I've said it once, I've said it uh, several dozen times on stream already, this is not a mill deck. I am running just one Tome of Horrors in the market. Yeah, sure, okay, I, all, all, I'm also running Liz in the market, which I'm gonna get to in a moment, but, and yes, uh, using this Tome of Horrors, you can mill the opponent, but that's not why it's here. It is here for the second ability of once per turn you may pay four to draw the top card of the enemy player's deck. And if you have seen some of my latest epic uh, highlights, including uh, you playing this deck already, uh, you've seen uh, that opponents are sometimes just hitting themselves, as I called it, uh, because this is your other source of card advantage. You're just you're just grabbing good cards from the opponent's deck because, well, if the opponent is playing bad cards, then you're just winning anyway. Right? Right. So yes, uh, usually in my previous decks, like Milt, uh, like Miltome, uh, you're using Tome of Horrors for the first ability. In this one, you're using it for the second ability, but the milling also sometimes counts. Uh, especially that we're running lists, uh, but first let's get to Malediction. It's a four cost double shadow spell that gives each unit minus three, minus three this turn. Uh, everyone in your deck list is safe aside from Incarnus. Also everyone in your deck list is safe from Aramod's designs. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that just means that this is really a safe pick against any and all aggro decks. Next up, we have Liz, Champion of Linrai, a 6-cost triple primal 6-6 six, six mage that says at the end of your turn, the player of your choice discards their hand and draws that many cards. Uh, usually, you mid-game, you want to use it on yourself because you're holding a couple of power cards or a couple of power cards you've already taken from your opponent. 
using Tome of Horrors, uh, but uh, I have played some games uh, where I just target the opponent's face to either mill them because they're holding a lot of cards, or for example, if the opponent was uh, screwed early in the game and they're holding very valuable cards, like a group of five, six, seven very valuable cards, then you just drop Liz and turn, target the opponent's face, they have to discard them, and now they're gonna draw their po their power that they were needing, but they don't have the cards they wanted to play with that. Uh, also, this is making the opponent draw more cards, so that is the discard plan as well. And the last card in the market is Reality Breaker. Now, this one is the memest of them all, and the meanest of them all at the same time. It is an 8-cost triple primal 7-7 elemental that says summon, deal 1 damage to a unit. If that damage kills the unit, choose an additional unit and repeat this ability with damage increased by 1. Now, if Reality Breaker is your, is your sole unit uh, and you have Vara Sanctum in play, you're just killing the whole board, including Reality Breaker. Unfortunately, you're gaining some health, but yeah, this is, this is an additional kill spell. But I don't believe a Reality Breaker should be here. This is just for the memes. Uh, honestly, this is the flex slot. This is your personal preference. Just go for whatever card you think is necessary for the current metagame. Now, this is uh, the initial theory behind the deck. You're just playing for card advantage. Uh, you're trying to play Aramod's design and Malediction as at least two for one. You're, uh, you're using and reusing your Devouring Shadows and Cold Bloods to kill the opposing units. And you have... Um, access to some board sweeps, unfortunately not for flyers, with uh, Varus Sanctum and Tamaris. Uh, and you have a lot of life skill with those Varus Sanctums. So that's the basic theory behind this deck. Now let's get to several games and afterwards I'm gonna do some final thoughts and tell you what, uh, what can be changed in here. Alright, uh, yeah, this is a control deck. In control decks you need at least three power hands. And I'm talking about hidden power such as Vara's Favor and uh, Seek Power as well. Just uh, at least three, if not four, out of your 33 power sources. Now this is a hand with, a, with an early removal, with some card draw, with some later hard removal. So yeah, this is what you wanna wanna go for. Vara's Sanctum is the be all and all of this deck for sure and um, remember your requirements yeah, they are triple primal and infinite shadow uh, so first try to go up to two primal two shadow then play all the shadow you want and need uh, for devouring shadow the card that i have just drawn <clears throat> but uh, also remember you you have those blitrox main deck and list and reality breaker in the market uh, which uh, which require triple primal, so you have to have that handy. But each power on top of uh, that third primal is really not necessary. The opponent is going for a Hidden Road Smuggler here. That is a great target for In Cold Blood, but I want to draw with Wisdom of the Elders first. They probably... Their usual follow-up here is... Uh, their usual follow-up here is uh, Regent's Tomb. Uh, so we're just gonna lose a spell or Vara Sanctum, but if we lose a spell, we can reread it. Unless we lose reread, then we don't lose any of our meaty spells. Uh, if we lose Vara Sanctum, then we'll just have to draw another one. Uh, but I don't believe a lot of people are valuing Vara Sanctum as much as the people who are playing with Vara Sanctum. So I remember in this case the opponent did not go for it, but went for rather something else. And boy, do they have a choice here. This is a really meaty grip. The only problem is we they are going to draw a card. And then we have to deal with Elias, but we can deal with Elias. Now I've drawn a power and I, I do have two pieces of removal. I wanted to go for Wisdom of the Elders once again, because remember, this is all about card advantage here in those control decks, because if you're not, if you don't have control, uh, sorry, if you don't have card advantage, uh, you're just drawing more power than the opponent is. Uh, if you're not using your Aramod's designs or, mal or the market malediction for card advantage, uh, then you have to have your draw spells, you have to have your, um, you have to have your invokes. Now I am playing the non-shiny Varus Sanctum, because that is the Varus Sanctum they've seen, uh, off of uh, Sabotage. 
Now, usually I would just play the shiny because, yeah, because I could play the shiny. But given that the opponent has seen this card, I'm I'm playing this copy of the card. That is just a small thing, but that is uh, that just means the opponent knows two, not three, out of all those five cards here in hand. All right, next up, I thought for a moment about going for Tamaris, but that is not such huge value. And first, I'm going to go for Incarnus. And Incarnus, well... Bard of Violence does nothing, Unspeakable Torment does nothing right now because we have lower health than the opponent, but Alder Veil Ripper is a big unit, and Tamaris has shift. I mean, if you play Aldra to get Tamaris back, it doesn't proc Vara Sanctum, but still, but still we are getting an additional unit, we are dealing one damage on the ground. Uh, the question now is, how can the opponent fight with Incarnus? Now, if the opponent has just, let's say, those two units, they're just going to be attacking 4-4 four, four each turn, and I am attacking uh, Yellow Eternal for 6 uh, with Life Seal, which means I am, run I am winning the race. Now uh, they are going for a second card. It is also noteworthy that the opponent is not only playing 4 copies of Hidden Road Smuggler in their main deck, but is also running at least 2 copies of Even Dune Smuggler, so that uh, that means yes, it is a heavy control deck. If you had, if you had any reservations that it's a mid-range deck or something like that, if people are running more than four smugglers, yeah, yeah, it's control. It's heavy control. Now from this one, I remember the opponent is gonna uh, Shen play Shenra Speaks. Maybe if not now, then in uh, the next turn. Now I uh, did play a second Varus Sanctum and attack because a this helps me with the race and b. Okay, Incarnus has 9 attack and is 1 hitting into its mastery, into her mastery. Now, Mkar's Blood Wolf is not necessary. Ghost Form is really redundant in this deck. Wretched Talon can get rid of a unit from time to time. And this Wretched Talon is gonna, gonna come into play, into effect uh, in, a, in a very good way later, as you're gonna see. Now we are taking a hit for 15, but it doesn't matter because we are giving it back for 12 of lifesteal. And the opponent is only lifestealing for 9 back. And next turn we can just in Cold Blood there, or even Lightning Strike their own Elias. But right now the opponent is playing Shenra Speaks, which means we can go for another unit like Aldra or, uh, or uh, another Varus Sanctum or something like that. Or a second Incarnas, this one is even better. And because this is drawing us a card right now, and I do believe Beast Colors Amulet is a good grab here. The opponent is playing a rather controlling deck, as I've already said, so Aramalt Design is out of the question. I mean, I'm going to have four uh, dead cards when I when I draw them anyway. And this Beast Colors Amulet on my Life Stealer is going to be quite good. Yes, I know the uh, when I have two units in play, the Life Steal is not coming into effect at all. Uh, but uh, I believe the opponent will have to kill one or the other uh, unit sooner or later. And Incarnus is getting its mastery anyway. And Hostile Takeover was a good thing, from what I remembered, and Edict of Makar. But Account of the Huntress costs nine, right, uh, costs 9 right now, but we are at 7 power, which means it's not that far off being played. And it's still a 7-7 seven, seven flyer that uh, on summon kills an enemy unit. So, yeah. That is a good thing. Now, as I've said, the opponent is probably going to be uh, to want to kill at least one of my units. And uh, here is where Wretched Talon comes very handy. Get it? Talon? Handy. Uh, with, killing that, with killing that cultist and attacking... Well, the opponent is on 15, but Dizzo's office is giving them a scheme, which is an answer in the next four cards, which means... Yes, I want to kill this Ops office before I go face and face the opponent. Uh, so yeah, I I am one higher in power. I have a unit. I have more cards in hand. So all the card advantage from those two Wisdoms of the Elders and two Incarnuses uh, and their Masteries are coming really handy right now. Uh, now I want to kill uh, the small cultist before attacking with my unit. And then we're going to see what happens afterwards. I do have that Blight Pass Smuggler to grab something from the market, but that's not going to matter because the opponent is surrender surrendering to our card advantage right now. Okay, guys, on to game number two. Four. 
5 power, Smuggler, that can get us a Malediction, and a Varus Sanctum. What more do we need? I mean, if this was an aggressive deck, this would be a Flood, but this is a control deck. And we have a 6 cost that is a centerpiece of this deck, already in hand, which means this 5 power, this 5 power is technically 4 power and a card from our market, which is even better. We have all our requirements, which is triple and triple. So that is a good start uh, for this game. Second smuggler is probably going to come in handy as well. Now next, uh, we can get rid of one of those shadow sigils. Unless I draw a blue source, then I can get rid of the primal sigil, obviously. Crownish Paladin, it's probably Paladins by now. I can also just get rid of that Seek Power and grab either Edict or Malediction or Tome of Horrors. All of them are, are up for grabs, but given that I have a second Smuggler, I thought to myself, okay, I can play a Power, I can play both Edict and the second Smuggler, even if I uh, want to take Varus uh, Sanctum out from my hand for a moment. I mean, it's going to depend on what I draw, obviously. Here, it's an, it's a rather easy block. If the opponent has a buff uh, for their Paladin, it's all good. If not, well then. Uh, Elodis Elite is a card that usually provides AP Paladins with the most synergy. And in my opinion, that is the card that determines their win rate the highest. Uh, now here I believe I sent off Lightning Strike and went for my Tome of Horrors because right now I am slightly slowly running out of cards. I mean, sure, if they if they kill one of my smugglers, I have my Varus Sanctum, uh, which makes the other smuggler much more deadly. But rather than doing that, uh, uh, when I still have two of them. I'm just going for Tome of Horrors. I will be drawing from the opponent's deck. I will be creating mark my card advantage that way. Another Nivius Inquisitor. Yeah, right now I am very, very scared. Really very scared of the opponent having any and all decimates. Uh, we're grabbing a sh Shadow Sigil from them, but I'm playing my own Shadow Sigil. It does not... It's not necessary for the opponent uh, to know that I drew from uh, a Shadow Sigil from their deck. Fortunately, the opponent in this situation only had a second shadow. I mean, their emblem was second shadow. It wasn't a decimate, otherwise I would be the one who was being decimated in this game. Uh, instead, they are playing Seek Answers twice. Honestly, I've never taken to Seek Answers as a card, either in draft formats or like anywhere else. Uh, yeah, we're, we're drawing from the opponent's deck. Anointer of the Faithful, thank you, opponent, for uh, for war crying that. And yes, right now I'm showing the opponent that I've also drawn a Shadow Sigil from them. The opponent is starting to emote us down, but uh, I'm going to talk about emotes in an article in the future, probably. Uh, and in the meantime, the opponent is just trying to go wide here. Now, Vara Sanctum is not going to come into uh, come in handy, probably, in this game, because we are going wide as well. Uh, but in the case, uh, hmm. here I think I just want to pilfer an additional card from the enemy, just to try and win with their strategy and synergy. Because if you're stealing one card from the opponent, then it's a good card or a bad card or a synergistic card that is usually not synergistic with my deck. But if you are stealing multiple cards from the opponent, like right now if I steal another Paladin, that one triggers a proc from Annoyer, sorry, Anointer of the Faithful and grabs a 1-1 weapon. So there is that. Now, the opponent is still sounds Decimate, which is very good and very fortunate for me. They're playing Common Cause, giving them an influence, which means aside from this Paladin, they have at least one more Paladin in their hand. Uh, Blitrock Linerize Listener. Hmm. Okay, let's grab a power. Let's play Pilfer, because we can play the Shadow Sigil and Blitrock, or we can just play Hero of the People. Because why not? It gets a plus one, plus one weapon, because it is a Paladin after all. And we are starting our attacks with Incarnus. And we are milling the opponent for three as well. I mean, this is not the win condition, uh, but it is still something we can do. I don't believe the opponent... Well, the opponent can be running something like... 
uh, something like Immortalized main deck or in the market, but uh, aside from that, yeah, uh, it is rather an upside than a downside in this matchup. Now, all I want is for the opponent not to draw any decimates. But right now, with my rather wide board stage, I believe we should be good here. Cast into shadow. Fortunately, I don't have two cards of the same faction. Otherwise, the opponent would be able to decimate. Uh, in cold blood, what do I want to get rid of? Is it Elaz's Elite or something else? No, I just went for Blit Rock. Grabbing doesn't matter. Scouting party is for... Uh, scouting party is four blockers and I am already dealing damage to one of their most uh, annoying units that is uh, Nivea's Inquisitor killing it getting the mastery up to two on Blitrock next turn I can have three pings or even four pings because Varus favor for one grab a power with that three other and that means I'm just gonna kill the remaining two Nivea's Inquisitors and yeah this is this is how I uh, or wait, I can also go wide here on all of them, give my Paladin flying. Uh, Tamaris is not targetable with Cast into Shadow, they have the second one in hand. And yes, this is a victory lab, but uh, mainly due to the opponent not drawing any Decimate. I mean, uh, yeah, you've probably seen that I have milled a couple of uh, such cards from their deck, and there, there even was a Cleansing Rain main deck there, so... <laughs> gotta watch out you gotta watch out okay on to game number three now this looks like two power but it is in fact four power it is rather lacking primal right now but with double varus favor we can probably really get there um the opponent is getting time and borderlands lookout off of that common cause which means that the opponent is probably running elves now, I was thinking about just running Shadow turn 1, but uh, yeah, I do have that Lightning Strike, which means uh, which means I still can kill the Elf turn 2, and I don't want my future power sources to be depleted. Uh, so yeah, that, is, that was a consideration of a depleted power source versus... Uh, versus receiving one more damage. Now, during this fight, uh, one of their units is going to die. For sure. The question is which one? The one that isn't dealing the damage back to the opponent's face, that is. Opponent is doing nothing right now. And uh, I am going to just kill that elf. Because if the board is clear, if the board is empty, then I can do anything and everything here. Uh, opponent is playing Lethrai Sky Strider, which means it's very good that I have dealt with, with their unit. They're not proccing the ally ability of this. And this also shows that if you have two Varus Favors in hand, and if you have enough power, just don't run them out willy-nilly, because there are a lot of two health units in the current metagame. Like, even in Karnas, you're just gonna, you're just gonna kill in Karnas more often than not. Uh, with that. So so just if you have to just keep them for as long as possible unless you're missing power drops then then no then then just go for it Now in this situation I could be going for malediction or a tome of horrors, but as I've said tome of horrors is my usual go-to and now I can just uh, I can just play lightning strike on their flying elf uh, so that they're not drawing a, a card off of it and next turn I can play tome of horrors and steal a card from the opponent so there is that. Now I think I should play the third primal uh, because yeah I have those all those primal cards in the deck and in the market. Stealing uh, Tavia Lethroid Raid Leader from the opponent and this is the part where we're just gonna probably win with the opponent's uh, combos than our own. Still? Still not a mill deck? Still not a mill deck. Not yet at least. All right, this is a lot of power, honestly. And also, honestly, we can go rather wide here. I mean, we are, uh, not this turn, but in the future turns, we are also drawing an additional card uh, from the opponent. <laughs> wow, that's a lot of border scouts there. I opted to discard uh, a power card here to create two elves to put some pressure on the opponent. 
so they know how uh, what it looks like to be on the receiving end of elves. Mm, also, I can just uh, play, uh, you, sorry, play use the tome and play Blight Pest Smuggler with the remaining power. And grab a card or two. Lethrize Soothsayer is a great pickup here. Unfortunately, I don't have the spare power to play that one. Yeah, we're milling the opponent for some. Now, Lethrize Soothsayer is going to stay here, but we are going to go for Liss, I believe. Um, I mean, you could also go for Reality Breaker if the opponent just breaks out of control. And you, you can even start with pinging our own elf. That doesn't matter, really. And the opponent is probably just drawing power and thought, yeah, that's the end of it. Okay, let's get on to the last game. Yeah, this is three power, but we are lacking a lot of things. And I don't have any double influence cards, uh, double influence power such as Insignia or a Seed. So yeah, I'm, I'm just going to ship that. And honestly, I prefer a six power hand, two of them that deal da dealing damage, than a three power hand. Even a seven power hand, because two of these power deal damage, one of these cards can change a power into a removal or stuff like that. Now, once again, what I've said in the previous game, if I have two Varus favors, I'm just keeping them, just uh, trying to kill an opposing unit off of that. Well, Varro is is not going to get killed with that, but still. Now, I'm probably going to grab a Malediction in here. Because my unit survives Malediction, their unit doesn't. Also, remember, they they decimated, so this is, this is just huge, huge, huge advantage here. Also, I played third Primal because I've already drawn Blitrock. And I know that I'll probably be playing Blitrock next turn, <clears throat> unless the opponent plays several cards, or stuff like Iconvara's Favor or Ermod's Design. Crownwatch Paladin, sure. But I believe it's still Blitrock, just to draw a card. Mm, Ice Bow is quite synergistic with Varus Sanctum. I mean, Ice Bow says the unit wielding the Ice Bow deals one damage. So if you have a deadly unit, you play Ice Bow on it, you just kill an opposing unit. Unless it has Aegis, uh, like this Paladin over here. Also right now I can just use my power to proc Blitrock. Unless Blitrock gets destroyed, then... Uh, then it just doesn't work like that. All right. Now, given that I've drawn a second in Cold Blood, I'm going to Varus Favor here. And even though the opposing unit is not uh, receiving damage and is not, uh, and we are not gaining that health, we are still drawing that power, and we are still uh, we are still getting rid of all of them. Fun fact number one, they had another one in hand. Fun fact number two, one of them was Warcried, which means it was the top unit of their deck. So yeah, that was a really good hit off of that in Cold Blood. And honestly, I've played in Cold Blood on that unit, not because it's powerful, because it's very, very annoying. Like, seriously annoying. I've also chosen to, to just play this here. This Tamaris to have, uh, to have a presence on the board, unless it gets cast into shadow. But then my, uh, my listeners are not getting cast into shadow. And the death elemental, sure. We can just get rid of that in one way or another. The opponent has a fa has a stop on two, which is probably an immortalize or a sinister strike or a draw strength. And here, here we're just stalling for time. Soul flame rider. Now it is costing three. If the opponent decimated one more time during this game. It would have had cost zero, which means I could have just played Aramal's design and destroyed it alongside that, uh, that death elemental. But uh, yeah. On the other hand, 
I can always play in the cold blood and just get rid of all the copies from their deck. Yeah, in the cold blood, still one of my favorite removal spells. You can say what you want. That is, uh, that is a decent end of the story. Not naming the card end of the story. Okay, our unit is dead, but the opponent does not have any tempo. Uh, sorry, any any fast clock on us. I mean, it's a 12 turn clock. I hope I'm gonna draw at least something in those 12 turns. Uh, also, with Aromas designs, I'm just waiting for the opponent to play another thing. Reconnaissance, they're decimating once again. They don't have any more Soul Flame Riders, so the number of times they decimated during this game does not matter for them. Tamara's Earthshaker, uh, if I shift her to deal one damage to that Death Elemental, I cannot play Icebow on her to deal the remaining damage, so that is not a combo here. I just want to have a clock on the board as well. I mean, Tamaris does combo quite well with uh, uh, with Vara Sanctum when she's being shifted, but she's still a 4-6 flyer for 6. That is still a very good stat line here. Okay, the opponent played a second unit. Now I can play Aramod's Design to my card advantage. And that's what I'm doing. Also, if you hover Aramod's Design on the board for a moment, you're going to see uh, some bullseyes over the units that are getting destroyed with that one. And that is uh, that is honestly a huge deal. I It stopped me from killing my own Titan in... Uh, uh, when I was uh, when I was playing uh, with uh, Tarkov's trading post more than once, I've also killed one of my titans with an uh, with a hasty Aramod's design because I'm old and forgetful. Anyway, when it comes to this game, it seems like it's the good old matchup of Flood against Screw. Uh, but hey, Vara Sanctum, which means yeah, Tamara is still alive. The opponent was not able to devour. All the shadows from her so she's still attacking for two in the air all the time she can still play get ice bow on her and kill an opposing unit so that is still a piece of removal uh, that i'm probably going to use here so the opponent cannot raise with their own life stealer or rather not raise but keep up with the tempo <laughs> all the power in the world. I was thinking of whether to attack or to play Icebo and I thought to myself, yeah, I want to race. I I am going to uh, to draw a non-power sooner or later, hopefully. And I do have Vara Sanctum, so I do have a lot of synergies right now. With other copies of Tamaris with Blitrock. Oh, that's what the opponent stole. Hmm, that's not nice. You stole from us! Oh my goodness, even more power. At least the opponent is going down to 5. And yeah, in this case I am playing almost all the power, because if I draw Blitrock, I can play Blitrock for 4. Uh, if I am at 13 power, I can play Blitrock for 4, and then ping 3 times. Hmm. Spiteful Strike, the opponent does not want to die here. Don't blame him. And it is indeed Blitrock, but this interaction is going to be much more fun. Okay, so I'm first I'm attacking because then my Tamaris is down to an O2. Then I'm grabbing a Storm Spiral because Storm Spiral does kill Incarnus, does kill my cursed or rather weakened uh, Tamaris. And that, in turn, allows Blitrock to be the deadly one, so that Blitrock can ping their unit away and can ping at their face. Now, if the opponent does not kill this Blitrock, next turn I can just ping, ping, ping their face away and win in that way. So, opponent, you don't have removal? You don't have removal. All right, then. So, it's going to be good old one, two, and three. The opponent has a fast fell, probably another spiteful strike or a draw strength. In the meantime, I'm drawing, I'm drawing snow pelting, but I at that point I just I just wanted to to use Blitrock to her fullest potential to show you guys how it's done. And the opponent also wants to show us what they were holding up. All right. 
So this was the last game, let's get back to the studio and talk some more about this deck. Welcome back guys, I hope you did enjoy the games. Yeah, there were some crazy ones, for sure. Uh, but uh, these were not all the games I have been playing with this deck recently. I mean, it is not a 100% win rate deck, for sure. It has a lot of weak sides. Uh, for example, right now it is uh, weak to all Void-based st strategies because it has no interaction with the opposing Void. It, uh, it has problems when the opponent is just cursing your units left and right and you cannot get rid of all your own units. But it is a deck that might be considered uh, a heavy control deck that is generating a lot of card advantage, even if some of those cards are semi-random off of the eight listeners. But if you are enjoying the expedition format, if you are enjoying grabbing some cool cards off of the listeners, if you like uh, playing hardcore control, wait, did I say that already? Well, you, you might just want to, you might just like playing control. Anyway, this might be the deck for you. But remember, just before you play it, uh, just think about what you want to, if you want to do some uh, switches here and there, for example, maybe one or two less seek power, maybe change the reality breaker into something else. I mean, you have your own experiences in the current format. I have my own more memeish experiences. So uh, personal choices may vary here and they may vary very, very, very much. All right. This is going to be it for the video. Thank you very much for watching. And remember, if you enjoyed it, just click on that subscribe. Thank you and see you next time.